well, some of you have probably realized I'm not Bill. If you haven't realized, realized that, well, golly, geez, what else do I have to do? I mean, I have a full beard and I have a full head of hair. <laughs> so Bill is going to be on sabbatical this month, and so unfortunately, you're stuck with me. And with that, we're going to be going through this sermon series. But before I get into that, let's pray. Lord Father, we thank you so much for this great and wonderful day. We thank you so much that no matter what happens in our lives, you are always there and we are here to praise you. Lord, we pray that you would um, just be with us right now. Open up our hearts, minds, and ears to what you have to say. And Lord Father, we thank you for how no matter what we do, you love us. Amen. So I'm going to be looking a lot at Americans. So if I'm saying we, us, them, they, I'm talking about Americans. So I'm going to have a lot of fun poking fun at ourselves. So I wanted to start by looking at America today. And one thing that I found kind of humorous, kind of interesting, was going to and doing some research on Netflix and Rotten Tomatoes. And I looked up, what are some of the most popular genres of shows, movies, that Americans enjoy watching? So out of 5,300 North American adults, 18 or older, the top five genres were revealed. 61.1% of us prefer comedy. 51.5% of us prefer drama. Third place got uh, action adventure at 41.6% of us. Crime drama came in at 40.1%, just eking out suspense and thriller at 39.5%. So, with that being the case, I don't know if you caught something in that survey. The word drama was used twice. We had drama and we had crime drama, which I found kind of interesting because to me they're both the same thing to an extent. I know you can make an argument, but if they were put in the same category of drama, that would have affected the stats there. In 2021, I was interested in what was the most popular TV shows of 2021? Because we had all those results in and you know, every day it's changing right now, so 2021 is done, let's take a look. And they gave me a top 10 list of the most popular TV shows in America. And Nick, if you can get me that, the first five up there. Number one, was a TV show called The Expanse, which was a sci-fi drama. Next was Shameless, I think there, is that it? There we go. Shameless, which was a drama comedy. Grey's Anatomy, which was a drama. Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which was a musical. Virgin River, which was a documentary. Rick and Morty, animation comedy. The Walking Dead, action drama, horror thriller. Lucifer, fantasy, The Blacklist, action crime drama, and lastly, The Good Girls, which was a comedy. So when you look at this top 10 list, does anyone notice something that sticks out a lot? Drama. Now, I know no one here is going to be in any of the statistics I'm talking about. I know no one here at this church causes drama, enjoys drama, partakes in drama, so I know you are not mentioned in any of this. But as Americans, out of the top 10 shows, five of the favorites were drama-related. And I would argue, Americans, we love our drama. If we don't have it, we find a way to make it. So, we pay attention to the things that we're interested in, right? We now have these things called mobile phones that are with us 24-7, pretty much, and we let them tell us stuff that is of interest to us, or they let us know when something that we think or they think that is interesting notify us, right? Everyone here has some apps on your phone, and it could be anything. I know I'm guilty of Facebook and ESPN, which means... If someone mentions something on Facebook, likes something on Facebook that I'm associated with, or Facebook in general thinks, hey, Matt might be interested in this, I get a notification. I don't like that one. I would, in fact, if I didn't have this job and I did, wasn't required to have a social media, I would get rid of it. But the one I do willfully put on is uh, ESPN. 
because I very much like my sports, and I very much like knowing what's going on day to day in my sports world, particularly of the teams I'm interested in. You get lots of rumors. It's this time of year. I have to turn off the notifications because my favorite soccer team in the world is going to hire another new striker, which they've been doing for the past seven years, and they have hired two strikers in that time. So a lot of the news is not important or relevant, but yet I get a notification, and I spend time looking at these things because I'm interested. As Americans, we love entertainment. We love to watch TV shows. We love to watch the news. We love to watch sports. It's entertain me, entertain me, entertain me. I think that's one of the biggest focuses for Americans right now. So that was the light side. Let's look at the dark side. Let's look at our country. Our country is broken, it is divided, it is, I mean, just a few weeks ago, we know about the shooting in Uvalde. We know about the different crimes, the different things that are going on today. We know that as a country, no matter if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or independent, or whatever uh, political view you have, we are not unified. We are unloving, unjust, selfish, obnoxious, and I would just say downright punks. It doesn't look so good for us right now. So what do we do? That's what the main focus of this sermon series is going to be. Let's change. The end all goal, I would argue, is to let's change our country. And so we're going to look at that today. How do we change our country? Because we know that we're, we're messed up. We know things aren't going well here. We know that there's something wrong, so let's fix it, right? Thank you, Jesus. We are not the only country that was committed to God, that followed God, that served God, and fell away, are we? If you've read your Bible at any point, particularly if you've read any of the Old Testament, you know that there was a country named Israel who um, I would almost say has a love-hate relationship with God because... Israel, a, a, a country dedicated, created, set apart for God, would be like, oh, God, we love you. We praise you. Oh, look, there's something shiny. And they'd wander off. And then they would receive some of the, the, the situations and the consequences of that. And then, oh, God, you're so good. Thank you. We love you again. Oh, look, something else, something shiny. I mean, time and time again, you look at the story of Israel and they would follow God, and then they would reject God. And they would follow God, and they would re get reject God. And if you look at just that, you might get whiplash. So very quickly today, I'm going to be covering some of that whiplash. And so I wanted to start with, particularly I'm looking at Israel during the time of kings. So this is after the prophets. This is after when they would have um, the judges and the individuals leading. This is when they officially have a king and a government. And if you know your church history, you know there weren't a whole lot of good kings for Israel and their, uh, or Judah, but there were a few. So I wanted to read out of 1 Kings 15, 9 through 14, and we're going to look at the story of King Asa. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to rule over Judah. Now remember, King David had Judah and Jerusalem, or Judah and Israel together. But Israel and Judah will be separated not long after. So you're going to hear a lot of Israel and Judah as separate nations. So Asa's reign over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Makah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father had done. He put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Makah, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it in the brook of Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all of his days. So we see King Asa as one of the first good kings mentioned after King David. Now, there's a phrase in there, I'm going to say a lot today, and I want to make sure that not to confuse anyone, when we hear the, the phrase, as his father David, or in the, uh, followed in the ways of his father David, 
None of these guys I'm going to read are actually the sons of David. This would just be a lineage and saying, hey, I'm related to David. So this would be a great-grandfather, great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, and so on and so forth. So no one who actually says that David has been dead for a few centuries, and he's not having kids anymore. So I just want to be clear about that. So we see with King Asa that he is following in the ways of David, one of his grandfathers. And he is um, purging Judah of false gods. We see that he even overthrows his mom, who was a, a, god, a, a priestess for a different cult. And so we see that Asa leads Judah well, and as long as Asa lived, Judah would follow him and follow God. And things would go well. They would uh, be obedient. God would bless them. And then once Asa died, something shiny came up, and Israel would go back to other gods. So that happens until the king uh, Jehoshaphat in 1 Kings 22, and basically it's the exact same thing. Just like with King Asa, Jehoshaphat is going to get rid of some of the idols, he's going to purge Judah, he's going to lead and do a good job, and Israel's going to follow until he dies, and then they wander off again. And then King Joash comes up in 2 Kings 12, and it's the same thing. I mean, pretty much, if you read these stories, it's, they say the exact same thing over and over. So I'm just quickly going through it because we see with Jehoshaphat, with Joash, and with Jotham, same thing. They overthrow uh, some of the idols. They don't get rid of everything. They never get rid of the high places. They never fully purge the land of the false gods. They always do about, you know, 80, 85% of the work and stop. And as long as they live, Israel is fine. And as soon as they die, or sorry, Judah is fine. And as soon as they die, they go back to worshiping false gods. Until you get to the story of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah at a six, uh, uh, 2 Kings 18. At 25, Hezekiah begins to be king. And he leads them well and into the Lord. Now, if you want the full story, I did a sermon about a year ago on, the king, of, on king Hezekiah. I would encourage you to, to go back and watch that on YouTube to get the full story, because today I'm just going to do a quick sum up, because King Hezekiah, even though he was young at 25, becomes king, he leads well. One thing that is very different from him than the rest of them is he does go and completely purges Judah of all the false idols, and he does lead them really well, and he does completely restore Judah with Israel. Unlike the other kings, which would get 80, 85 percent of the work done, he personally, or he made sure that they were all removed. But just like usual, once he died, something new and shiny came around. And so they began to worship a false god again. The last good king before uh, Israel and Judah are completely conquered is the story of King Josiah. And that's where my focus is going to be today. King Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34. And I'll be spending a lot of time here, so if you want to follow along in your Bible or in the Bible app, feel free to go there. But we're going to be looking at the story of King Josiah today. I'm going to go ahead and read these first two verses. 2 Chronicles 34, 1 through 2. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Okay, let's stop right there. Did anyone catch how old this kid is? Eight years old? I know we have kids back there right now that are older than this guy. Can you imagine what it would look like to, for us right now as Americans to have an eight-year-old president? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of thoughts and opinions about, you know, sometimes that might be better. I don't know. But it's crazy to think an eight-year-old becomes king over Judah and that he follows in the ways of the Lord. Man, I, I, I love this story because it's crazy, for one, but it's amazing to see what God does here. And so I'm going to keep reading, but let's just fully embrace this is an eight-year-old leading the country of Judah. 
In the very next verse, verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, the Asherim, and the carved and metal images. So we see he became king at eight, and in the eighth year of his reign, so we know that means he's 16. At 16, he begins to follow in the ways of uh, the Lord. He starts to follow the God of David. So at 16, this kid truly becomes, I would say, what we would call today a Christian and starts really following God. Just like many of us today in this room, isn't it? I know many of us accept Christ when we're a teenager. Those are some of the most prominent years for people to come in and know Christ. I know I, I accepted Christ at 15, so Josiah has a story very similar to many in this room. Now, I know some of you in this room did not give your life in your teenage years or in your childhood, and you gave it in your adult life or your young adult life, and so that would be a little bit different, but I want to emphasize, you know, Josiah, there's nothing special about Josiah. He is just like you and me in some ways. Now we see, so that happened at 16. But when he turned 20, he began to purge Judah of all false gods and idols. Anything that was claiming to be God, but not be belonging to the one true God, he began to purge. And the next few verses give us a lot of details about that. So we're going to go ahead and jump into that. Verses 4 through 7. And they chopped down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and they cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the ashram and the carved and metal images, and he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali in their ruins all around. He broke down the altars and beat the ashram and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. All right, there's a lot that just happened there, and I'm going to make sure we cover that, but it's when I read stories like this, I do not know why Hollywood has not made more videos out of the Bible. I mean, there's a lot right here that you could totally make a movie on and would do well in today's culture, I think. There's a lot of action. So because of that, I want to make sure we catch everything that went on. First off, Josiah removes altars and false god images. So like some of the other kings, he goes out and he's making sure that these are going to be removed. He's going to make sure that they are taken out. We see that he burns some of them. So, you know, however it means, they are going to be decimated and destroyed. Um, one thing I want to make, uh, you might not have caught, he burns the priests of these false gods on their own altars. So not only is he actively going throughout his land and making sure that there's any image, any altar is getting destroyed, but if he finds you being a priest of one of these other false gods who has led his people astray, you're not only going to be condemned to death, you are going to die a very painful death, and not only in the process, you're going to be dying on your own altar, and that altar is going to get destroyed in the process. So he is sending a very, very clear message, I think. He cleanses Judah and Jerusalem and the other major cities. I mean, he is going out town to town, inch by inch, mile by mile, actively looking to remove all of this. And then he returns home to Jerusalem. So I want to, so let's stop right there. Josiah is the king, right? Does the king not have authority to just go tell people to go do whatever he wants? Couldn't he have just sent his soldiers or sent some people, made us brute squad or whatever, and just sent them out? He could have. But he didn't. He personally went out and did this. Now, many of us have worked, I think, if, everyone, if not everyone in this room at this point, I think has had a job. And many of us have had a boss, right? And we knew when we were working at our job and the boss showed up, well, something was about to happen, wasn't there? Either something that wasn't getting done was about to get done, 
Maybe someone was going to be getting in trouble, but the one thing you absolutely knew, this was important enough for your boss to show up, and he was going to make sure that it got done right. Now, whether that actually happened or not, because whether he was competent enough, that's another story. But we know that when the boss shows up, it's important. And the king of Judah felt like it was so important that this task got done that he himself went out and made sure it happened. Because just like with our own bosses, we know when they show up, they make sure the job gets done and it gets done right. And Josiah leaves his house, leaves it, or leaves his castle, leaves his home to make sure this is done. And he wonders until the job is done, and then he got to go home. That tells you how important this was to King Josiah. This was a task he took on himself. He left his kingdom, and he personally led this group of people to make sure that the job was done and the job was done right. And so in my research, it was showing that this was possibly the greatest revival since King David. So when King David was king over Judah and Israel, that was where, you know, Israel was at its peak. That was where it was at one of its best points. And this would be the next closest revival where people would come back, the Jews would come back and begin to worship God. So I find that funny from the beginning to the end, how God kind of used that with these good kings. Now, there are other bad kings that come after this, and they are going to be eventually conquered by the Babylonian Empire. And Judah and Israel will no longer be independent nations, but within a part of the Babylonian Empire. But that was so important that the king Josiah did this. Over these next few verses that we see that I'm going to kind of skip ahead to, so we see after that, Judah is purged, Judah is cleansed of all false gods, false idols, false prophets, false priests, and now as King Josiah is sitting in his, in, his, uh, in his courtyard, he's thinking, well, hey, the temple hasn't had any work done on it in a while, so let's clean this up. Let's, let's, he starts to uh, um, send out people to, to re- restore the temple, so they start doing some projects around the temple and fixing the gate, fixing the, uh, the walls, fixing different things. And also start doing kind of like a spring cleaning and start cleaning it up and starting to re, uh, rededicate it and get it all spiffied and looking new again. Is during this time, one of the priests find a book. And they f- think that the king should read it. So that's where I'm going to pick up the story in verses 18 through 21. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, Abdin, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go and inquire of the Lord for me, for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us. Because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in the book. Did anyone catch what this book is? Fred, I know you know the answer. Say it. It's the book of the law. This is one of the most important documents that they have, and they just so happen to find it. That would be the equivalent of us cleaning up solid rock and spring cleaning like we do and just so happening to find a Bible and saying, huh, maybe we should read this. That's kind of what's happening here. The king has no idea of the book of the law. If the king doesn't know, do you think that the average Joe knows? No. They had wandered and strayed so far off they didn't even know the book of the law. They didn't know the laws that God had given them. They did not know the covenant that Moses had made with them. They were that oblivious. And his immediate reaction was he tore his clothes and he humbled himself. And we see a couple of things here. So first, that action of tearing his clothes, and, and that is an extreme act of remorse and humility. He gets, 
we read this, and I know we violated laws one through duh, 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 duh. We done screwed up. He's like, there is no doubt in his mind we screwed up. And even though while I've been around, I've been trying to do things right, I wasn't even aware of this, and I know I violated some of these, which means the rest of our country has most certainly violated these. Man, we screwed up. The second thing we see by his reactions, he was oblivious to this. He has an extreme reaction to reading this for the very first time, which tells us he hadn't a clue. God's own people had no clue of the laws that God had given them. How far had they wandered? But by his reaction, we know he's oblivious. The priests are oblivious. The country is oblivious. How sad. I also think in this moment, as he's experiencing this, as he's hearing this, I think he's able to see, this is my own take on things, that he got to see from God's perspective of what was going on. And he could see from God's perspective what Judah had, was doing and how wrong they were. And I think he understood God's heart and was able to say, man, we screwed up. And we screwed up big. So, he sends out some people to inquire to God of, what do we do? What do we need to do to fix this? We are sorry, we need to fix this. So this is God's response to that group. Second Chronicles 24, or 34, verses 24 through 25. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Ouch! They're in trouble, aren't they? And we see God is going to be just, and he is going to hold them to the account of what the, uh, what the covenant is. And it's going to be painful. But if you keep reading, we see one other thing. 26 through 28. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants and you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the disaster and that, that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back the word to the king. We see here that God is going to be just, and he is going to be justified. There are consequences for their decisions as Judah to leave God. But in this moment, we also see something else. And we see that God sees Josiah. And he gives him favor. And he says, this, all, this is going to happen, but you don't have to worry about it because this isn't going to happen until you die. I'm going to give you peace and you will be able to go to your fathers in peace. And then this will happen. And it's because of how you humbled yourself and because you have a heart for me, essentially. You are pursuing me. And man, you, were, you look at it, he was not set up for success, was he? And yet... We see how God loved him and met him where he's at. So, while Josiah lived, they followed God. Anyone want to take a guess at what happened afterward? Shiny things. And so Israel will have been conquered by the Assyrian Empire a few centuries before Judah gets conquered by the Babylonian Empire. And that becomes the end of that story. But I set that up to look at us today as Americans again. Because I read this story, and I think in, the, in, in God's word, I think we see a few things. Now, I want to be clear, 
These are not promises for us as Americans. I want to be clear about that. Reading this doesn't mean this is going to happen for America. But we do learn some things about the nature of God that I do think are very applicable today. The first point is Israel rebelled against God, and when they repented, God welcomed them back. How true that is in our own lives. I mean, we're using Israel as a country, but if you look at Israel as a person, how, do we not do that day to day? God, I love you, and I'm pursuing you, and then I sin, and I screw up, and I wander off. I find something else that's shiny and interesting, and then I come back to you. Time and time again, we see whether it's a person, whether it's a country, when we humble ourselves and we take a step towards God, God is always there to take a step to us. We have a God that loves us and wants to be in a relationship with us. And he loves us enough that when we are screwing up and we're doing stupid things, okay, there's consequences. He doesn't want that for us. But he loves us enough to let us go. And he loves us enough that when we repent and we realize it, that playing in the mud isn't the same as playing at Disneyland, he's right there and he says, I love you, I forgive you, let, let me clean you up. That is who our God is. God can use anyone, even a child, which means he can most certainly use you and me to change this country. If God chose and used an eight-year-old to lead a country, I know that means he can use you and me too. And I know in all of our lives, we either, oh, I can't do this because I blank, blank, blank. I did this. I've done that. I'm not. I, it's usually I've done this or I don't have. And either way, we're insufficient to do it, and yet, God uses us. Because time and time again, we see in the Bible how God uses anyone to do what he wants. And there is no, no one that cannot be used by God. Which then leads us to the logical conclusion, he can use you and me regardless of what we have or what we don't have. Lastly, we need to change so that we can change our country. Like I said earlier, I know those statistics don't apply to you, but I also know they apply to you because they apply to me. So before we change our country, there's some other changes that need to happen, don't they? Because Josiah had one unique thing, I think, that no one in this room has. So just by a show of hand, is there anyone who is involved in a political group or who is, you know, a, you know mayor, you know, has authority within our judicial system right now, our governmental system? Is there anyone here who works in that capacity? Take a look. There's no one which means we don't have the direct authority to go and do anything. We don't have the president here. We don't have the vice president. We don't have a mayor or governor. We have no actual authority right now, anyone in this room. But yet, we still can change this country. So I hope you come back next week and learn more about that. Just like the old days, I like to leave it with the to be continued. So, every week we're going to be looking at a different focus to ultimately change our country. Because with these things that we learned today, where God can use anyone, he can use us. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you haven't done. Our God is so much bigger so prepare yourselves because I'm going to go about to go from preaching to meddling. I, I'm at least going to give you a warning. Because if what's true about what God did with King Josiah and Israel, that means God can use a Democrat to change this country for him. It also means God can use a Republican to change this country for him. It even means that you could be neither, and God will use you to change the country. You could be an alcoholic. You could be a blasphemer. God can even use you if you're not a Christian, but it's a lot better when he does. 
So if God can use any of these people, let's figure out how we can do it and how God can use us today. And because we see a God who constantly comes back to us when we go to him, we're about to go to him in communion to remember the sacrifice, to remember what he did for us, for you and me, the reason we're here today. I hope it's not to come around and pal around and see, who, uh, see what's going on in our lives. That is important, but really we come here today because we love God. We come here because we live for him, isn't it? I want to read something out of 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We partake in communion because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus and to remember the covenant that he offers us to have our sins forgiven and to be in a right relationship with our God. It is through his death that we have life. Before we partake as per Jesus' instructions, let's have a moment to evaluate our hearts, to evaluate ourselves before we partake of this communion. There are elements at y'all's table. Would you go ahead and pass those around now and make sure that the elements are passed to the people on the sides, please? And so we uh, partake in an open communion here. And so if you have given your life to Jesus, whether it was here at Solid Rock, whether it was at a different church, you are welcome to participate and we encourage you to to join us in this communion. Um, And so as you guys pass out the elements, I want to read one more thing because this is my favorite Scripture that it points out how important this was to Jesus and how, much, how important this was to him then and I would argue why it's still important to him today. Luke 22, 14 through 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer." For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus earnestly desired and looked forward to this moment before he would suffer. And he would not partake again till we were with him again. So with that, Our Lord was broken so that we could be restored. The body of Christ broken for you. And simply put, the blood of Christ shed for you. So with that, we're going to go into a prayer time now, which is one of the best parts here at Solid Rock. We always end with this. 
And so for guests and visitors, I apologize. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you will not judge us too harshly on the associate pastor being here and not the senior pastor. But if you got a yellow card, please fill that out. Turn it in the back. But this is normal for us and for our family here. We know we're about to go into this prayer time and it is a time where we get to talk to God about what he wanted to say to us and what he did say to us during this time. And it might have to to do something with the message. It could be with one of the lessons you went to at class. It could have nothing to do with any of that. We would encourage you to participate and, and just be in prayer. And you can pray with people that are sitting next to you at your table. You can go across the room, pray for someone. We're going to have some people set up around so that if you want prayer, these are people who are willing to pray with you. See, Fred's going to be over here on this side, and he'll be available for prayer if you want to pray with him. I've got Cody in the back back there. I've got Harry in the, over by the door. I've got Maria. If you're a woman and want to pray with another woman, Maria's available in the back. I'll be over here on the side, and there's, you know, as you know what Bill says, there's no, nothing special there's nothing uh, uh, value or not valuable. There's nothing any special about these people. They're just available to be with you in prayer if you want it. I'll be off over here. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, let's just have this um, sacred little moment. And then we'll rush off to lunch and try and beat the Baptists. <laughs> so go ahead and would you stand and join us in prayer?